Hmm. All right. Um, I am absolutely unprepared to make this video. <laughs> no, no, I'm kind of prepared. Uh, there are some things that I wanted to talk about for the last few days. Actually, it's more like uh, uh, four days ago now. Um, in response to one of Piro's videos on YouTube about consciousness, will. Um, I've been doing a little bit of uh, refreshing on uh, certain topics. Not very specifically. Actually, really what I was just doing mostly was uh, watching some Yale courses on psychology that are uh, free to view on YouTube. Um, really what I'd like to get into is just need to make a video about uh, these ideas that I had four days ago and uh, look at them a little bit more and I figured it, why not start a video right now and just record the process um, I imagine it's hard to uh, convey the state that I'm in right now. Um, in the last four days, some interesting things have happened um, with uh, one of my neighbors and my girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend, I don't know what to call her, a, uh, a woman. I really care about. Yeah. But those are not subjects for this video. Um, this video will be about uh, the origin of kind of the origin of, of neurons, the origin of the brain, the origin of the mind, and of consciousness how how the mind arises from the brain I don't want to say it's a mystery but uh, it's an unknown for me at this point but I think it's pretty pretty obvious where it could have come from or where it, where it has come from um, Obviously, all the factors that were necessary, the, the sheer amount of time that it took, um, you know, I don't really want to call them trial and errors, but the number of trials that it's taken, if you think of each life as a trial. And, uh, each branch that each uh, you know like each combination of genes genetic material um, that led to me or or humans in general um, I don't want to think of those as being an error so much the trial and error thing it's the easiest way to say it and hopefully it's not misinterpreted um, but I mean where where did the uh, where did the brain come from the central nervous system and to what degree do various life forms have it um, or really what is what is a mind there's so many questions I would love to just sit and ask questions and uh, and not expect answers and maybe I'll do that 
more often. Just enjoy the questions. Uh, but I, I'm addicted to the answers. Uh, not so addicted to questions, although I do enjoy when they pop up. I don't like being bombarded with questions. Just, just give me one question and I could spend the rest of my life answering it. Or find a happy medium. Uh, one, one good question a day. Um, and depending on how quickly the answer comes up, another question. So, there's not really a set time, you know, certain things, depending on a person's knowledge, can either be imagined logically, uh, rationally, reasonably, or considered over time. Um, so, so, I was thinking about the difference between what we call plants and animals. Um, I'm sure most people would agree that plants are alive, um, but most people would probably agree that uh, plants don't have minds or that Better yet, plants don't have brains. Um, but they do have responses. Um, and I feel that that's kind of the origin of it. Reactions uh, to sunlight, reactions to stimulus. I mean, if you uh, poke a hole in a tree, sap comes out much like our blood kind of acts as a as a plug when it dries out um, but one of the main things that I'd like to address is the uh, the flow of two separate substances or two separate uh, two separate things I hate being so vague I apologize but uh, um, could be forms of matter that would probably be the best way to put it two separate types of matter Whereas, I mean, take a plant for instance, and you have, we have the leaves, and, and they take in uh, carbon dioxide for instance, among other things, no doubt, and, and sunlight, uh, photons. They increase the orbitals of the electrons, adding energy in the form of photons and electrons. Excuse me, of uh, higher orbital fo excuse me, electrons. And really, it's in a sense a photon because the photon is absorbed, as far as I recall, um, by the electrons. And when the electrons go down an orbital, um, they emit photons. So, so what's I mean, what's going on? What's going on here is is fascinating in and of itself. Um, but in this case, I would like to add some things to that. Um, if you imagine. A, an atom or a molecule um, sharing electrons 
particular molecule in this case, and the uh, electrons go up in their orbital, they allow, or that allows them to create new bonds that uh, it may not have previously been able to make. And those bonds are what allow us to form the chemicals, form more complex chemicals. So, in the leaves, you have you know, certain chemical reactions going on, photosynthesis for the most part, but no doubt there are more than just that. There is more than just that going on. You know, just inside each of the cells. But, uh, maybe, maybe I should just show the pictures that I've drawn. I would like you to imagine it. I'm trying to imagine you watching this and uh, the way you might imagine it visually. Um, what I really want to focus on is where these things are reacting. Um, and I haven't even brought up the other things. But the. Uh, say you get all these chemicals in the leaves, all these, you know, all this stuff from the leaves, and it's traveling through the circulatory system of the tree, and it essentially goes uh, down into the trunk, and down into the roots, and that energy that electricity is what allows the the roots to do work and the roots then push further into the soil and there's more resistance you could probably figure out how much energy it would take and uh, it's, it's a pretty much closed system. No, not so much closed system, but uh, if you were to just take the tree itself over time, um, it gains mass. Where does that mass come from? Um, some of it comes from the air. And some of it even comes from the photons. But... I would imagine a lot of it comes from the ground, through the roots, in through the roots, where you have water and minerals and other nutrients that are essentially being drawn in. Some of the nutrients are drawn in through the roots and up the trunk and out into the leaves to uh, increase the growth of the leaves um, to create new buds and extend the branches to gain more carbon dioxide and more sunlight. So you have this kind of process that uh, a circulatory system really is what it is. Um, in a way, it's almost two separate systems. It could almost be viewed as a sort of um, a, a motor system, a nervous system. nervous system where the electricity that is being gained from the photons 
is going down to the roots and powering them and then the uh, then the circulatory system of the tree draws in the moisture and the minerals and, uh, and nutrients and brings it up into the leaves so almost like two separate systems at work something like that so I guess the important thing is what's happening what's happening at the bottleneck um, in the trunk and not, not what is happening now but what has happened over over millions of years hundreds of millions of years Perhaps even longer. I don't recall uh, when plants first started showing up. A um, uh, rough guess would be about a billion years ago. Um, perhaps as little as the uh, about the Precambrian, maybe 600 to 700 years ago. Somewhere around there. Just right now would be my guess. I, I haven't uh, looked it up in a while. But at that bottleneck in the trunk of, of the tree, in this case, it's a tree. But I mean, if you really imagine just about any plant with uh, that takes in carbon dioxide or, or any chemical from the air and the electrical energy from photons and and nutrients from the soil and water from the soil and brings that up just about any plant in the middle um, there'd be an interaction between these two chemicals uh, with enough, you know, with enough diversity, um, I would like to say something before I finish that thought. That there, there are going to be a lot of people, I imagine, that are viewing this that don't fully understand evolution or the. Uh, the amount of trial and uh, you know, I don't want to say error but the amount of trials that life has been through considered that number before um, and at this point I don't have a really solid number I, I think it's very important to to have that number um, or at least a, a figure a, an exponent you know, um, or just even to be able to say um, whether it's quintillions, sextillions, septillions, um, octillions, nonillions, or even decillions of times. And these are very large numbers. Um, certainly not for, for people who are used to dealing with them. I mean, they're, they're still large, even for people who deal with them on a regular basis. Um, you know, I would, 
would like to imagine that I probably deal with those numbers more than most. Um, but I'd like to imagine even more that I don't. That everybody, everyone deals with them more than I do. Or considers them more than I do. But they are ridiculously huge numbers. And uh, maybe I will give a, a sort of walkthrough video for those who are unfamiliar with them. So, the number of times that life has changed the number of times that DNA has been replicated and an alteration has been made um, if I could if I could just say a number right now I would guess it's something something close to six trillion. This is my video. <laughs> I can I can say whatever I want. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with 1,000. Um, you, you've seen it before. Um, I live in a population. I live in a city with a population of 10,000 people. Um, thereabouts and 10,000 at the present anyway 10,000 people in this city um, there are about 300 or excuse me there's about 10 million in this state so 10,000 people in Alpena and 10 million people in Michigan. I, just, I want you to think about that for a bit. And uh, keep in mind the uh, how much 1,000 is. And thousand is a is a fairly large number um, if you've ever seen 1,000 people at one time it, it looks you know just in one in one location it looks beautiful um, 10,000 people in one location even more beautiful uh, 100,000 people can't recall uh, a time or an image where there have been 10,000 people in a single, or excuse me, 100,000 people in a single photograph. That's, that's quite a bit. Um, now, if you can, if you can just try to imagine that, I'm not sure where where your imagination stops, uh, and then where things become harder to imagine. But if if you've you've probably seen um, football games, large stadiums filled with people, and um, there may have been something like ten thousand people there on that. Uh, power exponent um, but 
think of 10 times that many people and you have 100,000, which is a lot, 10 times, you know, it's just one finger, and that's 10, 10 digits, so, yeah, it's a lot, just by comparison, 1 in 10, 10 to 1, Extend that up to one million, and that would certainly be a, a beautiful sight to see. Ten, or excuse me, one million people. But you keep going. Just pull back a little bit more and, and imagine 10, 10 million people and, and I guess right now if you can imagine if you can imagine 10 million people and what that would look like um, perhaps uh, from a helicopter or a plane the, the, the mass of it, the, the sight of it. And now imagine what it was like when you when you saw this. Ten, compare that, the ten million, to ten the the ten thousand. And and there you have. 1,000 times more people Take the, the ten million, the ten million that you, you were viewing from above, and pull back and imagine one thousand times that, and you have more people than could be squeezed together um, shoulder to shoulder standing up you know shoulder to shoulder face to face or excuse me face front to back um, standing you know standing in I mean, of, of your average human size, standing in the, the, the state of Texas. So, I mean, some of, some of you, maybe in Europe, or Australia, or Asia, you know, India, or Africa, The image of Texas may not be something you're very familiar with, uh, but you you could just go to Google Maps or um, go to go look at a map um, of the Earth as the Earth, not uh, not a Mercadian map, not a any kind of you know, not any kind of two-dimensional map, um, a three-dimensional map. The amount of space that, that that amount of area would take up, and, and ten ten billion people could not fit in that area. Um, if 
I, if I was more prepared for this. If I was to give this as a lecture, um, I would certainly have more comparisons for more people from various parts of the world. Um, just to give you a sort of idea. And that's, that's more people than there are alive on the planet right now. a lot, but for an astronomer, or a physicist, or a mathematician, um, or someone who's used to dealing with exponential numbers regularly, uh, it's, it's not that big of a number. Um, 1,000 times that would be 10 trillion. Mm -hmm. 10 trillion would seem like a large number to a lot of people. But it's, it's not, not as far as numbers go. How many people? 1,000 times the state of Texas. Um, my guess would be that would be nearly, that would nearly be all I, the. The landmass of Asia, Europe, um, Africa, Australia, and, uh, and maybe even North and South America combined. So that would be how I many, I mean, just filled with people standing up. Maybe even as, as much as the entire Earth. Or the surface of the Earth, you know, including the water. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think it's that much. But it could be more. It's hard to, uh, to kind of imagine a thousand sometimes. You know, we, might, we might imagine 100, and it might feel like a thousand. Some people might imagine 10,000 when it's only really 1,000. Let's say it's the whole surface of the Earth. Uh, not the whole surface of the Earth, the whole land mass um, of people standing up. Ten trillion human beings. Uh, uh, the way that we exist right now, that might seem impossible. There are no laws that say we have to stay this way. We could certainly become more, more massive, more connected. Uh, let's say. 40, 40 trillion human beings might cover the surface of the earth. Um, 
speaking out as a human being, that might be uncomfortable. But uh, if if human beings were I'm trying to try to go along with this, more like uh, bacteria, and not just not more like bacteria, but like cells in uh, imagine cells in a petri dish. How they kind of multi split and multiply, and uh, each one. One multiplies, divides and multiplies, divides and grows. Uh, it certainly would be imaginable. I mean, for me, um, we would have to lose a lot of of the way the things that define us as humans. Um, certainly you would have to be okay with the contact. Um, and uh, not desire a large amount of space for yourself. Uh, but, and that would be about 40 trillion, 40 trillion human beings could uh, cover the surface of the earth. Just say that I haven't done the math, but that's 40 trillion. Now imagine 1,000. covered with people standing up shoulder to shoulder um, you know, completely comfortable with that um, and, and if, if you have a hard time imagining it um, you know I mean if you think about what we are back into the soil and, uh, so there would need to be other other things occurring but they could occur with us uh, or they could we could make them occur in us uh, and contain them within us maybe even to the point where all we would simply have to do would be to breathe and to, to occasionally take in moisture um, if, if we didn't, didn't manage to get our um, ability to evaporate excuse me our, um, our sweat control by then but try to imagine that and imagine and, and just let go of of everything that tells you you couldn't do it. Let go of everything that tells you it wouldn't be right. You know, because it would be possible. Certainly. Um, you know, 
networking would be easy as far as uh, you know, I mean, people would die and people would be born. That's the the one forty trillion people on on the surface of the earth. No, nothing says that it doesn't have to be, uh, or that it, it does have to be just people standing up. I mean, in the water, um, people. And you have to take into account the, the possibilities of things like uh, humans being able to breathe. I mean, if you just think of a, a life form as a human, and, and maybe that's what I should be saying, life form instead of human, because the word human, you know, has, uh, has definitions. And the definitions are, are, uh, are boundaries. You know, if you cross that boundary, you're no longer human. says that we couldn't live in layers in the water. So, we can just, just imagine it all. And the entire, the entire surface. Continue increasing the thickness to the point where we could have people, the, the entire planet could, could very well um, be composed of people. The entire thing, all, all the way down to the core course, we would have to cool it off gradually. Um, uh, maybe think of it as a, a swarm of bees in, in winter. If you're familiar with how, how bees, excuse me for a moment, if you're familiar with how bees in winter How they stay alive. Bees in winter stay alive by circulating um, around. They try to keep the queen in the center of the cluster. Um, the bees in the closer to the queen are warmer than the bees on the outside even though they're all moving they're all shaking a little bit 
and the uh, friction from that uh, adds to the heat and the warmth and you know, at the same time they, uh, they consume honey um, I would imagine maybe some of them pass honey in a way perhaps um, nibble on a little bit of a comb and then uh, you know get, get it on their mouths and then uh, make contact with another bee's mouth and uh, they maybe kind of pass it in like that and maybe they, they circulate around um, at this point I, I don't know all those details but I could imagine it Imagine humans in the earth like that. Um, Forty forty trillion mm. stuff. I'm I'm not familiar enough with the uh, volume formula for a circle to say how many humans that would be inside or uh, the earth would be um, imagine it. Um, when, when the bees die, I, I don't know if their bodies are consumed by the other bees, or if they are pushed out, or stored somewhere, or what. Be interesting to know. Yeah. For the sake of a, of a lecture or a discussion of this nature. We yeah. wouldn't be able to push. Could, but um, why at that point? Um, the thickness. Of it. Uh, there would have to be some sort of structure. Some some humans would have to evolve into support structures. Um, I think there would need to be some space if the humans would have to continue moving around so that they could travel through each other um, or they would just kind of wiggle through each other like a game of Twister and uh, yeah it would be, it would be interesting circulating the water, circulating the, the food and the nutrients. So, yeah, well, 1,000 times 40 trillion. would be 40 quadrillion. That wouldn't be it. That wouldn't be the number of uh, of people. Forty trillion would not be the number. Forty quadrillion. Excuse me. Um, it would be more than that. Uh, we could we could say since at this point we haven't you know said that people have to stay as uh, massive or as dense or. Uh, in any sort of composition um, 
let's say we go from the 40 trillion people on the surface, covering the surface of the earth, to 40 quadrillion. Um, that would you know, move their way down. Let's say the thickness would then be 10 times. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Um, 1,000 times? Yeah. There we go. Um, that's it. Um, 6,000. 6,400 kilometers from the surface of the earth to the core. Um, one person is about two meters. Let's say one person is two meters high. Um, there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer. And so there would be 500 people stacked up in one kilometer. So to increase the thickness to one kilometer, or excuse me, to uh, 1,000 people, you would then have to go to the depth of two kilometers. Um, at that point, there would need to be some sort of support structure. Um, fluid would do do nicely. Um, so if we were to, say, um, consume the surface of the Earth that is above sea level and convert that into humans while also taking yeah, uh, from the water the oceans, the depth of the oceans um, creating a sort of balance in the ratio of uh, water to non-water um, in a human body um, could could be done I think with with the amount of water that is available on the surface of the earth so we could create a thickness the uh, obviously the farther you go in towards the center of a sphere, the uh, skinnier kind of the people would have to be in order to create those the layers. But, so, 40, 40 trillion covering the surface. 40 quadrillion, um, a thousand times as thick. Yeah, that'd be two kilometers. Um, 6,400 kilometers divided by 2 kilometers and you have 3,200 so uh, let's for the sake of math say 1,000 more people um, or, or no, let's go let's go 3,000 3,000 more layers. Um, and the people would get smaller and smaller. Uh, 
they could very well be less less dense. Um, they could they could become sort of support structures. Um, they could become networks. They could become tubes. They could become anything to uh, anything for the system or the, the structure itself. No. Three thousand. We have we are at forty quadrillion people, two kilometers thick. Uh, now we want to go up to quintillion. And we had forty before. We have three thousand now. So one hundred and twenty quintillion people. And I mean, if you just, if you just imagine it, size decreasing in size, they would get very, very tiny, obviously, um, towards the core, or what was once the core of the Earth. 120 quintillion. just want to do the, do the math now and figure out you know, just how many how many people in in bodies of this size um, the the earth could be turned into even though I know that it's it's it would be so far in the future um, things would change so much then size of humans um, it, hopefully it'll, it'll vary more I, I really hope it varies more and I, I hope I don't know do I want us to still be considered different species or, or to be different species or do I want people to still consider everything and uh, every every uh, iteration, every variation to be considered human? Um, I'm not really I'm not really set on the word human. We can consider ourselves life, life forms, or something else. One hundred and twenty quintillion. Let's just stick with that number. Take uh, one thousand more of these balls of life. We'll say before this has occurred, before this uh, thought or uh, experiment or process has, uh, has occurred, that. Humans were finding ways to travel to other planets, that they found them, and that they began the process on those planets. One thousand of them. Now, in order 
to stay the way we are, we would have to find planets that have the ratios of water. important elements. The, the important elements, the most important ones, are probably the best. Um, especially carbon. Since you know, we're composed of carbon-based molecules, so we would have to find, uh, maybe that's where we would stop. Um, or maybe we could find a way to make carbon, um, which I'm fairly certain by then we will. I don't see why not. Uh, given enough electricity, uh, I don't see it at all hard to imagine. Um, with, uh, with particle accelerators. So, it's possible, we're not limited, can imagine it and I hope, I hope you have enjoyed imagining start just the start of the spread of life
being alive. I don't want to end this video. Uh, I believe it. There are some restrictions. It's currently at one hour and five minutes. That's a, that's a long video. I, I hope you've enjoyed this. For those of you that have watched it. going.